I will provide an overview of the capital funding application process, as well as discuss organizations and project eligibility requirements to access city funding. This meeting will be recorded and posted on Borough Hall's digital platforms for future reference. While I enjoy face-to-face -face engagement, feel free to turn off your device's camera and please keep yourself muted until we get to the question and answer portion of the info session. Today, we are joined by my partners in government who will provide some additional context as to what happens after your organization receives a capital allocation. Uh, we will be joined a little later in the info session by David Veroli from the Department of Design and Construction. You'll hear me refer to that uh, agency as DDC. Uh, we will hear from Alyssa Figuera from the Economic Development Corporation, EDC. Kevin Maloof and David Barron from the Department for Cultural Affairs uh, is also here with us, DCLA. And we have Azizet Haiwat from the Housing and Preservation Development, HPD. I sent a few emails with the capital, the Borough Hall Capital Funding Fact Sheet, uh, DCLA's one pager, uh, EDC's one pager, and uh, DDC's over a hundred page long project handbook, essential information. Um, if you did not receive it, uh, don't worry, um, send me an email. I'll be posting my email at various points in the chat um, and reach out to me and we'll make sure you have all of that, those documents. Uh, there will be a wealth of information shared with you today and I encourage you all to take notes. Uh, I have my notebook, my little pencil uh, with me in hand. Um, as you can always learn something new, no matter how many times you've done it, um, please place questions in the chat as they occur to you. I or one of the panelists will answer it during the question and answer portion of today's session. My colleague, Mike Mutal, will be keeping an eye on the chat to make sure we don't miss a question. So thanks, Mike. Um, you may have heard that the capital funding process is very nuanced and can become very project specific outside of meeting the eligibility criteria, which again, we will discuss today. It can become overwhelming, but don't worry, I'm here to work with you throughout the process. Um, so, borough presidents are provided with an annual allocation of capital funding to appropriate to eligible nonprofits. Borough President Adams utilizes these funds to support infrastructure improvements across the borough. Uh, the allocation of capital funds are utilized in a diverse manner and fund improvements for academic institutions, affordable housing developments, community centers, equal purchases, construction and renovation, much more. While borough president often invests these funds in improvements to city owned assets, he also makes these funds available to nonprofit organizations for capital projects that serve a defined city purpose. Uh, throughout the borough president's uh, tenure at Borough Hall, he's allocated uh, over $57 million to housing projects, over $40 million to arts and culture. Uh, his main priority as borough president was bridging the digital divide in schools and has allocated roughly 44% of his portfolio to education. In these, uh, a lot of organizations uh, may find it very uh, cumbersome, but again, we're here to walk you through uh, this process. So don't get overwhelmed as I drill into <laughs> all the requirements. Um, as we jump into things, it's important to note that capital funding is made on a reimbursement basis and is not guaranteed. Uh, you will hear this mentioned at various points throughout today's meeting as it's a key factor in the capital funding process. Now let's talk about organization eligibility. For an organization to be eligible to receive capital funding, that organization must at a minimum meet the following requirements. Be a nonprofit organization, uh, have an operating history of at least three years and must be able to provide audited financials for those three years. You must have paid full-time staff. You must demonstrate an operating budget to support the proposed project on an ongoing basis. And you must have an established history of receiving operating funds from the city of New York. 
in the event that your organization is applying for a cap for capital funding for a real property project, your organization must have operating contracts with the city for uh, totaling $50,000 or more for the current city fiscal year, as well as the preceding two fiscal years. So we're talking FY 19, 20, and 21. You would need to have operating contracts of $50,000 or more if you're seeking capital for a real property project. In the event that your organization is applying for capital for a movable property project, the organization must have operating contracts with the city totaling $25,000 or more for the current city fiscal year, FY21. Now, certain organizational eligibility requirements may be waived if the, if the organization is a hospital, health clinic, if the organization receives operating funds from DCLA, or if it's a qualified affordable housing project. Now let's talk about those project eligibility requirements. For a project to be eligible for capital funding, uh, they must meet the following requirements. The, the project has to be used for a frontline service. Frontline service meaning the public can access it physically or through phone communication. If the project include items that are not attached to the real property, uh, such as a uh, vehicle, uh, it has to have a minimum city contribution of at least 50,000. So that's the minimum amount we can allocate to a capital project uh, that's movable property. If the project includes items that have a minor degree of attachment to the real property, uh, that minimum uh, gets increased to $250,000. Um, and for real property projects, such as renovation or construction of a property that the nonprofit owns, um, that minimum city contribution is $500,000. If the project involves improvements in an existing property, the organization, as I mentioned before, must own the property. So if you are a nonprofit that is renting your space, but you know uh, wants to do some sort of major renovation, that wouldn't be possible because you have to be the owner of that building. Uh, capital funds cannot be used for soft cost, such as design or rent administrative fees. Uh, capital funds go directly to brick and mortar projects, um, the vehicle, something touch and feel. So how does this all play out? If both the applying organization and the proposed project are eligible to receive capital funding, the organization starts out by developing a project scope because you need to know what you're asking the borough president to fund and to ensure that it's eligible to be funded. Once a project scope is uh, determined, the organization must obtain detailed quotes or estimates uh, related to their project because again, you wanna know what you're asking the BP to fund. After a project scope is determined, uh, you have to submit two applications as a nonprofit seeking funding from the Brooklyn Borough President. Uh, an application must be submitted directly to the Office of the Brooklyn Borough President via the Borough President's online capital funding application. A Google form that I will share with everyone in January once the applications are open. And you would also have to submit uh, via OMB CAP Grants portal. Um, the application process is slightly different for um, nonprofits that receive DCLA funding, which Kevin from DCLA will speak to a bit later, I'm sure. Um, once both capital applications are submitted, I will most likely be reaching out to clarify or obtain additional information if needed. Because, um, of course, it's good to have additional content and, you know, just really get a better understanding of what the project entails other than reading a project descriptions and a bunch of numbers. Um, I always say the more I know about the project, the better I can advocate for the project to be funded. If a capital application is satisfactory and complete um, and everything was perfect, you may not hear from me until uh, funding decisions are released following the passage of the New York City budget by the city council by the end of June. Notifications uh, 
are usually sent out a month after the city budget passes. Um, so if things uh, go well, you'll be receiving an award letter from me around July or August of 2021. Within six months after the passage of the New York City budget, uh, the applicable managing agency uh, will contact capital awardees to begin developing a contract, also known as a funding agreement. It's extremely important, extremely important uh, to remember that capital funding for non-city projects are made on a reimbursement base. Um, the city is under no obligation to reimburse an organization for purchases made prior to registration of a funding agreement. Um, so you, uh, you get your application in, in the beginning of January. Um, the application is going to close roughly the last week of February. Um, we work on the application over the next couple of months. Uh, we wait for the city budget to pass by the end of June. Award letters are sent out late July, early August. And at about six months, the managing agency reaches out to start talking about that project, you know, establish a funding agreement. And you don't want to purchase anything or start moving on that capital process for the allocation that you received until you meet with the managing agency, who, as I mentioned, we'll hear from in a little bit. Now, I know that was a lot <laughs> for everyone to absorb and you have, uh, you probably have a lot of questions. Please put them in the chat and we'll be sure to get to it a little later in the segment. We're gonna hear from uh, the first managing agency, uh, which is going to be the Economic Development Corporation. Uh, in my time doing capital, I, I found that, you know, projects are usually, uh, you know, sent to the Department for Design and Construction or the Economic Development Corporation. Those are the two larger, you know, managing agencies I see that our projects are sent to. Uh, so I thank you in advance, Alyssa, who is gonna join us and Tell us a bit more as to what happens after you receive an award from the borough president's office. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm excited that I'm seeing a lot of unfamiliar names um, because that means that there are new nonprofits applying for this funding um, and we're gonna see great projects throughout the borough, um, so that's exciting for me. I am Elisa Figueres. I have been managing funding agreement projects at the Economic Development Corporation for six years now, um, and I lead our Brooklyn portfolio team. And so citywide, um, the funding agreements team manages over 150 projects, um, totaling over $1 billion. Um, so, so what is our role here in what Candace is talking about? Um, so she touched on some of this. So I'll just go through it quickly. Um, this blue portion at the top is this application process that you're all learning about now. And then this magenta at the bottom is that funding agreement process that she was talking about. Um, so funding is allocated through this application process. Um, if you are awarded funding, you that funding would be in this upcoming cycle um, with that January start date uh, for application. Your funding would be appropriated on July 1st, 2021, at which point a managing agency would be assigned. I know I'm reviewing a lot of what Candace is saying. Um, and that is followed by the funding agreements process, which is where EDC or DDC contracts with a nonprofit to provide funding in exchange for the public purpose your asset provides. So for example, um, you are applying with a healthcare center renovation. Um, BP Adams, um, your other elected officials, the city of New York, all want that health, those healthcare services to be provided to New Yorkers. And so they're willing to give funding toward that healthcare center renovation in exchange for that public service. Um, and like Candace said, it is, it's not an intuitive process. Um, and so EDC has a suite of programming to help prepare you. Um, unfortunately, our 
Programming is currently suspended for this fiscal year, um, but we are tentatively set to restart in the summer. Um, so we have capital workshop that goes through the essentials of capital project planning um, and, and also briefly goes through whether or not this type of funding is the right match for your capital project, um, because as Candace said, it is a, a difficult funding uh, source to kind of master. Um, and then we have borough coffee hours where we go out to the five boroughs um, and each of the portfolio teams introduces themselves. It's an opportunity if you've never worked with um, this type of funding before to, to get those early questions answered. Um, and get introduced to the process. And then we will also have upcoming finance um, conferences to help connect you to friendly nonprofits, to friendly lenders. Just to say, we know that this is hard. We wanna prepare you. Um, so, so do reach out if you find that you need help here. Um, Candice, I don't know if we have David yet from DDC. I do not see David just yet. And as I mentioned, you know, we're all juggling a million different things and David got uh, pulled into a uh, really important meeting. So we're gonna give him a couple extra minutes and ha we'll have DDC, I'm sorry, DCLA, um, just walk us through that, their presentation next. So Alyssa, if you can stop sharing your screen, we'll have DCLA take it over and gives a, give us a preview. I know we have a few culturals on that will have a bunch of questions. So you guys are in good hands with Kevin Maloof and Darren Brannon is behind the screen as well. Great, well, uh, thank you, Candace, and thank you so much for organizing this webinar. This is a wonderful opportunity to speak to everyone and uh, give a very broad overview of the capital process and our specific agency, the Department of Cultural Affairs. Uh, the acronym for the department is DCLA. I will use the full name and, and the acronym interchangeably during this short presentation. Uh, my name is Kevin Maloof. Uh, I'm a capital equipment project manager here at DCLA. Uh, the information covered in this webinar will be available in the packet that was distributed by Candace. Uh, additional information you can find on DCLA's website. Uh, let me start by mentioning again that this is a very broad overview of the cultural capital requirements and process. If you are eligible for cultural capital funding, we will have an additional webinar to explore the details of requesting funds through DCLA uh, in the coming weeks. So New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, DCLA, is dedicated to supporting the, and strengthening New York City's vibrant cultural life among our primary missions is to ensure adequate public funding for nonprofit cultural organizations with large and small throughout the five boroughs. Uh, for more information, please visit our website again at www.nyc.gov backslash DCLA. Um, DCLA's major goals for funding capital projects are to enhance the public's experience of cultural life in New York City through projects that increase public access to cultural programming throughout the city contribute the, to the vibrancy and diversify the city's communities while maximizing the effectiveness of public and private partnership and to preserve and promote the highest quality cultural facilities, programs, and collections. So the next slide is gonna be the most important. These are like the four baseline requirements for your organ organization must meet to receive cultural capital funding through DCLA. First one, your organization must be a non-for-profit arts or and cultural organization with documented tax exempt status pursuant to section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Service Code. This is the most, all right, the next one is the most important part of the most important slide. Your organization must have received institutional or programmatic support from DCLA in one of the following fiscal years, FY18, FY19, FY20, and or FY21. It's also important to note that that institutional or programmatic support is not the same as city council for discretionary funds that is funneled through DCLA. Uh, your finance office at your organization or your development director will know whether you've met this qualification. Uh, 
Under the requirements, your organization must guarantee that any capital funding received from the city will not be used to advance or support any sectarian activities, including but not limited to religious worship, uh, instruction, or proselytizing. Other requirement, and your organization must demonstrate the capacity to take on a capital project uh, for funding to be requested. Okay. Uh, when drafting your request, please consider the following to ensure you are submitting an eligible request. The request must be comprehensive. It must like, create a new asset or a new system, or it can significantly upgrade an existing asset. Uh, comprehensive is defined as extensive, physically connected, or it's typically involving the four trades, electrical, plumbing, HVAC, or general construction. Uh, we'll discuss that more in just a moment. Um, the project must also provide a public benefit, benefit to the residents and all the visitors of New York City. Uh, the city makes a long-term investment in capital projects. So for equipment projects, example, the item must be usable for five to 15 years. For construction or renovation, the projects, the assets must be usable for roughly 20 to 30 years. There is a cost minimum attached. So for equipment projects, the minimum project cost is 50,500. Uh, for construction and renovation projects, the minimum project cost is 500,000 for non-city owned property. Others uh, are slightly different requirements of a city owned property. So the, the next slide is very specific. <laughs> On the legal requirements, how fun. Uh, when requesting capital funds from the city, please note that if your organization receives funding, it will be required to enter into a legal agreement with the city. When funding capital projects, the city must retain, retain an interest in the assets to secure the bond. The asset must be either city owned or if not city owned, a restrictive covenant or a security agreement must be executed. A restrictive covenant is executed when capital funds are used for a renovation or a new construction project. This ensures that the city has first rights on the property and enforces a public and cultural use restriction. All other parties with an interest in the property must subordinate their interests to those of the city. All right. Uh, security agreement is executed when capital funds are used for equipment projects. The security equipment, uh, sec the security agreement governs projects to ensure a public purpose and that the asset is used and maintained during its useful life. There are other agreements that might be needed to be executed. And there is a lot more detail to the ones mentioned here. We'll bring this up. We bring this up simply to stress that you are entering into a legal agreement with the city and you will be required to meet those terms of those agreements. Okay. Each construction or renovation project must be at least 500,000 on a non-city owned property and have a minimum useful life of at least around 20 to 30 years. Some examples of construction or renovation projects are construction of a new facility, like if you have a vacant lot and you need a building, uh, or you have a newly constructed like shell and you need a complete fit out. An expansion of an existing facility, such as adding additional floors. You can also significantly upgrade or renovate an existing uh, contiguous space. Let's say you have like a theater and you would like to renovate the lobby and the performance space, they, they would be contiguous. Um, you can upgrade or replace a whole building system, example, like a HVAC system or an elevator cab and mechanicals are eligible if they meet that minimum cost of a project. Be aware that uh, completion of a construction or renovation project range from about three to five years after groundbreaking. That does not include the scope development or the design phase. Okay, equipment projects, which is one of the things I focus on, are divided into two categories equipment systems or standalone equipment. The following definition from uh, our directive 10 applies to both equipment systems and standalone equipment. The system must be composed of mutually dependent and or physically or wirelessly connected elements that are integral to the system's function. So an example of like a standalone system would be a grand piano or like a cargo van. Uh, you buy one item and all the components are contained within that one piece of equipment. Uh, for equipment systems, there are like multiple items that are required to work together for a specific function. Like if you have a theater and you would like to include a lighting system or a sound system, or you have 
an IT system for your work office space, if we could go to those. Uh, each system must be at least 50,000, 5.0, and have a minimum useful life of five years. 95% uh, of equipment is purchased by DCLA, and it remains the property of the city. The exception to that is vehicles, where the organization will actually make the purchase of the vehicle, and DCLA will reimburse you for those funds. That, the reason the difference is it's a little easier for a title and registration if the vehicle is in the organization's name. Passenger vehicles must have at least a uh, 10 person or more capacity. So we can't buy like sedans or like sporty SUVs, sorry. Uh, you could buy a cargo van, for example, though, because the purpose of the vehicle is to carry cargo, not people. Uh, completion of an equipment project ranged from about two to four years from the beginning of scope development. As you can see, like cultural capital projects take years to complete. Uh, should you receive funding for your projects, there are many different agencies and oversight bodies that must grant approval several times throughout this process. If you require the asset between a specific time frame, please reach out to DCLA before submitting your request. We're happy to discuss your project with you. So we're going to go over a few ineligible items. Examples of ineligible requests and items are acquisitions buildings or land that are not eligible. Maintenance, such as paintings, carpeting, roof patching, facade repointing, surface treatments, essentially. They are not eligible as projects. Uh, if they are included as part of like a larger renovation, they can be eligible. Additionally, any maintenance line items in the request are not eligible. Once the project is complete, your organization is responsible for maintaining the asset. Operational expenses expenses such as employee salaries, administrative expenses, training are not eligible for capital funding. Signage uh, when not part of a larger project is not eligible and any signage with your organization's logo or organization specific language also not eligible. Public arts projects or artwork including murals and decorative landscape not eligible unless they are commissioned through DCLA's percent for art program which is triggered at certain funding levels and not up to DCLA or the client to determine. For equipment, laptops, application software, appliances, many others, there's specific equipment that is not eligible. Uh, if you submit for a cultural capital funding request, there is a detailed list of ineligible items in the request packet. Please look over that list thoroughly before submitting your request and ask. You can ask us DCLA if you have any questions. Also for this year, I want to note that modifications to HVAC systems in response to COVID-19, such as filter replacements, upgrades to fans and controls, deep cleanings of systems and the like, those requests are not eligible for capital funding. We encourage you to consult with your professional HVAC specialist to determine what steps to consider for improving ventilation as appropriate for your organization and facilities needs. And finally, in closing, Thank you for hanging with me. If you are eligible for a cultural capital fund, please go to our website and download instructions. Uh, there is a very long web link there on the screen that I'm not gonna read out loud. The link will be included or is included in the handout you received from Candace. We also encourage you to check with your elected officials for any pre-application instructions, not only from your rural president, but from also from your city council member. Uh, the request through cap grants is the official application to the city and your elected official may have additional requirements that you must, you must meet. Uh, the capital unit at DCLA, DCLA is working primarily from remote locations. So if you have any questions, please email us at capitalrequest at culture.nyc.gov. That's capital, C-A-P-I-T-A-L, request, R-E-Q-U-E-S-T, at symbol, culture, C-U-L-T-U-R-E, dot nyc dot gov. Candace, that's all I have. Thank you so much for giving me this time to speak. Kevin, thank you so much for that very thorough presentation. That's you said it was going to be a broad overview, but you gave us a lot, and I see that you have a lot of questions coming your way after. Uh, I see that the borough president joined us, and I would in invite him to deliver some remarks. Give us Thank a you. The numbers. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Candice, and all of you who are signed on uh, to find out about uh, the capital allocation. And throughout my years at Borough Hall, I have been really blessed uh, to have just dedicated staff who have committed uh, their time and energy to get, give you as much information as possible. These are not my, not my dollars, uh, they're your dollars. Uh, it comes from your tax, your taxes, and it is our way of identifying uh, real uh, methods to give and, and ensure that we get resources back to everyday people. And so our goal is to ensure that the process is not too cumbersome within our powers, explain as much as possible, have the experts on who can give you an overview of what you need to do to have a, a, a possibility of get, receiving capital from my office. Uh, as you know, those of us who know me, education is important to me, technology is important to me, uh, health and wellness, uh, these, are, these are areas that are crucial to uh, our office. And so good luck to you. I wish you a safe holiday as we cycle out of COVID. And I thank all of you who in one way or another play the role in helping uh, New Yorkers and Brooklynites uh, navigate the challenges of 2020. We're all waiting to get to 2021 uh, and have a more productive year. Uh, so be safe. And again, uh, thank you, uh, Candace, for doing an amazing job uh, each uh, capital cycle period. Thank you very much. Thank you, BP. Thank you. So I see that uh, David Varioli from DDC joined us. David, yes, you're going to that, be that is the correct. Last, yes, David, you're going to be the last um, agency presenting before we jump into the Q and A. Okay. Yeah, so please give us a little context as to what happens after a nonprofit receives an allocation from the borough president or city council and DDC is assigned their managing agency. Awesome. Well, first, it, thank you. It's very hard following the borough president, but um, I, I will try. Um, and as well as really following Kevin um, and Candace you, yourself. So thank you, everybody. Uh, DDC, the Department of Design and Construction, our role is a little bit different from DCLA's and why I'm not putting up a presentation, honestly, what Kevin gave you really applies to what I'm gonna talk about. And so I'm just gonna try and kind of pivot and kind of make the distinctions between when you're going through the DCLA versus when you're coming over to DDC. Um, but what, before I do that, I really just wanna stress a few things, you know, in talking with my group as to how we can do this better um, when you guys are in the budget process and you've been named in the budget and it's a project that comes to DDC, you know, and I, I can't, I cannot highlight this more. And this goes both ways, but communication, communication with DDC at all points during the process. Um, my, my recommendation to the organizations, and I get it, you know, these are really tough and lean times. Organizations are, are tight in their own staffing. Um, but in terms of staffing, in, in consistency, if you have somebody who's done this in prior years, you know, hopefully that person will continue to do it going forward. If there were staffing changes, if you could just let us know, and then what I would offer to you and to that individual and the new individual is we basically have like a handoff call. And then this way, the current staff and the new staff can kind of match up and we're all on the same page. Unfortunately, based on experiences that we've seen over the years, when staffing has changed and we were not part of the process, we've lost valuable time. And, you know, and I, I apologize, I, I came in a little late to the today's webinar, so I'm not sure if people talked about it, but from DDC's perspective, all things working really, really well, we've seen these projects take about two years. I have projects that have taken greater than two years. And a lot of that comes down to these two points that I'm mentioning on the communication side and on the staffing side. Um, you know, in, in the age of text messaging and emailing, whether we're remote or in the office, the more we can communicate, the better. Um, so on, on those two matters, jumping now into a sort of the, the substance and again, pivoting from the great explanation Kevin gave, I would like to just refer everybody to DDC's website. Um, we're at nyc.gov, it's NYC DDC. There actually is a private furniture store with the same initials DDC. 
Um, so if you're looking at a beautiful furniture, very expensive furniture, that's not us. Uh, we're the city's Department of Design and Construction. We have a great, I think, great website. But saying that, I would also just offer to all of you, if you've been on it and you don't think it's good or you think you could, if there's things that could be improved, please, please let me know. Um, totally, this is about making the process work better for everybody. There's no ego here. You know, we're trying to make this as simple as possible. Um, if you do go on our website, what you want to look for, I'll just give you the quick steps, is you look for the button that says contracts. You then click that on. You then see where it says work with DDC. And then you're going to see this other tab that says not for profits. That's you guys. When you open up that not for profits, you're going to see a brief overview of the application process. DDC has no role in the application process, but we wanted to share all the information with everybody. So we include it there. But where we'll, the substance of, of why I'm referring you there is really for the next three items. We have forms. We have literally put together a form for every step of this process. We have an FAQ. You know, so if, if you are thinking of a question and you don't wanna you know, maybe email us or wait for the response, go to the FAQ. It may have already been asked and answered. And then last but not least, timeline. The timeline really spells out all of the steps and how long it can take. Uh, which brings us back to my earlier points of the communication. I, I realize I just have a couple more seconds here and I know we all wanna to get to your questions. The biggest distinction where um, DDC and DCLA is, DDC is actually not purchasing any of the equipment or vehicles or the initial outfitting that you may be getting in the budget. We work with you, you will be doing all that. And there's some real interesting timing periods as to when you do it, depending on whether it's a vehicle whether it's initial outfitting equipment or equipment systems or just plain equipment. And there I would again, refer you to the webpage, but also working with my project managers to make sure you understand what that is. So biggest distinction is DCLA, if you're in that program, they will be doing the purchasing and working with you. We are on the other side of the table. We don't do any of that purchasing, but we will work with you to have a contract that will be registered and then work through a reimbursement process so when you do purchase it, you will be reimbursed, hopefully in a very short period of time. So I'll stop there and then hopefully we'll get to some really great questions. Again, thank you, Candace. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, thank you. And I apologize. We do have one more presentation before we move into question and answer. Um, and that I will ask uh, my colleague Azizet uh, from HPD to just give us again some insight on if you are pursuing an affordable housing project what what comes next? Great. Uh, thanks, Candice. Um, so um, HPD, or New York City's Housing Preservation and Development, um, we're tasked with providing affordable housing for the city's residents. And we do that not only by creating housing through new construction, but we also um, are required to maintain our existing housing stock here in the city. Um, and the way that we do that is through a number of our um, loan or development programs. So the information that the organizations have probably received, things that you've probably already reviewed, also things that have already been said by the colleagues that are presenting here, um, HPD is beholden to the same, same requirements with a few caveats. One of them being is that we do not work on a reimbursement basis. You are required to come to us first and you are to receive approval through a CP approval um, prior to you starting any work. If you have started work, HPD does not reimburse on it. In addition, we don't grant funds, we actually provide funds through loans. So we are not only held to capital eligibility standards, but we are also held to loan statutes. So our private housing finance law in our local finance law, um, that takes precedent. And we cannot loan for things that are not related to residential. So um, one of the things that also is a caveat is that we, or I should say, if there's an organization that is interested um, in pursuing affordable housing uh, project, you don't need to have the prior operating contracts. You still need to be a nonprofit, but you don't need to have um, received um, funding for operating costs. Um, so 
So yes, yeah, so through any of our loan programs, and we have a number of programs through new construction, through preservation, um, and through disposition. So you may not be doing a new construction project, but you may be a small, uh, small buildings owner, anything that's over four units. Um, you are eligible to apply through some of our small preservation programs. You've probably heard of um, the 8A program for some of you maybe, um, as well as we have a number of supportive housing projects, um, or I should say uh, supportive housing programs. So in terms of the items that we can actually fund, residential space only. The only time that we are able to fund any kind of space that is not residential is if it is a pertinent, that is the word that our local finance law uses, if it's a pertinent to the residential, that means that it is a space that is required in order for the residential component to actually happen. So let's say that you have a project or a housing project that has a community space on the first floor. We would fund the core and shell of that because the housing sits atop of it. Otherwise, freestanding commercial, freestanding community space, HPD does not fund that. It always has to be related and in conjunction to um, a housing project. Um, I think I already mentioned that in addition to that, that is because we need to adhere to our local finance law as well as our housing finance law. So in addition to um, non-residential space, we don't do initial outfitting. Very seldom does that ever come up. Um, and when it does, it is on very unique situations. So if you have any initial outfitting that has to do with a non-residential space, that's usually a no-go. Um, but if there's a project that you have in mind in particular, that's something that you can always come and talk to HPD about um, specifically. Um, in addition, Anything that is considered maintenance, I know this was mentioned before, but we have to stress this, anything considered maintenance is not eligible with HPD for capital funds. Those are things that you are required on your own to maintain, to keep um, your buildings operating. But in terms of major systems upgrades, so let's say like your HVAC, if you are doing oil conversion into gas, um, things like that, that is definitely eligible. The items that we would fund are hard costs. Um, there are very few soft costs that HPD will um, fund in conjunction with our projects. Um, and again, those are on a project by project basis. Um, I already mentioned that we don't work on reimbursement. Um, I think that's about, I think that's about it. So yeah, so once you've, um, I just wanna make sure that you guys understand that once you guys have received a award, an award from the BP's office, it's important for you to reach out to the agency. So I say this because we don't always, we don't always know, or our development team may not always know that an organization has applied for Reso A. For the larger projects, for like our new construction projects, they'll probably know because they're working with the developers well in advance of um, an organization applying. But for anybody who's on here that may be a small buildings owner and may need a large system upgrade and they're looking for some assistance, um, we may not know that you have applied for Reso A and that you want to start a project. So it's important that once you've been awarded funds that you reach out to the agency to let them know because it's not just a matter of us giving you the funds, you have to go through the due diligence of one of our loan programs. Um, so that takes some time to work through feasibility um, before you're actually able to receive approval for the funds and for a loan through our, through one of our projects, through our programs. So yeah, so anything else specific, you can always reach out to Candace and she will reach out to us so that we can uh, guide you through. Scope is a very big item with OMB, so that takes some time to work through as well. Excellent. Thank you so much for that insight um, when pursuing uh, affordable housing um, capital. Now, I did tell you guys it was going to be a lot. <laughs> and I hope you're all still with me, still sane. I did see a lot of questions in there. So thank you so much for that. And before we jump into the questions where my colleague Mike will be so kind and read them out for us, um, just wanted to quickly recap. So you have to ensure that your organization is eligible to receive capital. Um, 
those audited financials, full-time staff, prior operating contracts with the city, because those are common themes throughout all the different managing agencies. Um, it is very nuanced, but they're, they're those very basic eligibility requirements. Um, again, organization standards is the project um, meeting the minimum requirement for funding, um, movable property, uh, construction or renovation. Um, you mentioned, Aziz, at, uh, in, in initial outfitting, which is something I didn't get into much, uh, but organizations uh, can apply for initial outfitting uh, within the first six months of the use of a new space. Um, so if you're, and that's the only time really capital funding can be utilized to outfit a space. Um, so, you know, when you, you, your organization may have tripled in size, but we can't pay for furniture just because you have, you know, expanded. It has to be a new space you've moved into and have been there for at least six months. Um, and the common theme also was communication. Communication, communication, communication. Not only do I encourage um, meeting with me, keeping me abreast of what's happening with the project, but as you heard from the different managing agencies, they need to know what's happening to ensure that your organization can be reimbursed at the end of your capital project. Um, so I encourage everyone here and those who would be watching uh, online at some point to stay engaged, reach out to me. We, you know, I am the first line of defense in just figuring this all out and then we'll, you know, get you to the right people in right places. Um, so we're going to move into the question and answer portion. Uh, Mike, thank you for hey. being moderator. Of course. So one of the first questions is kind of a housekeeping item. If the presenters, and I know Candace did this already, can add their contact info in because one of the questions is, how do we get in touch with everyone? Uh, one of the other questions, which I think Candace also just kind of commented on, the initial application process, you have to be a 501c3 Correct. And how do people apply for 501c3 nonprofit status? That's a larger, um, and I don't think it will be, you know, something as, as expeditious that you would be able to get it, you know, reviewed and approved for this upcoming cycle. But reach out to me and we can just kind of figure out that process. I don't want to say the wrong thing right now, um, but yeah, uh, reach out to me and we'll work through that. When you talk about this cycle, Candace, what are the dates? So we, uh, the Office of Management and Budget hasn't given us the firm uh, FY22 application uh, deadlines just yet, um, but I expect the application will open the first week of January and close the last week of February. Um, if you know me, I constantly send emails, so I will definitely be keeping everyone on this one and everyone interested in a capital uh, application um, informed. It'll be in my signature of my email. It will be there. And just on the application while I can, because uh, it was mentioned as well, um, the OMB CAT grants application, that's the master application. That's what OMB is reviewing for eligibility and scope and all of those factors. But Borough President Adams also has a very simple, quick Google form that has to be completed as well as we pre-vet that larger capital grant application. Uh, so that kind of, you know, as it was also mentioned, things kind of come in differently. So again, it's just kind of a way for us to help each other out and make sure you guys ultimately get funded. So two applications, no firm date just yet, but be prepared early January for it to open and close late February. Another question, is the process different for entities such as houses of worship or community boards? Community boards, if I'm not mistaken, they follow, they submit their need statements to the uh, Managing agencies, community boards have another capital process. Again, I would be ha I will follow up with the community board, any community board interested in capital or um, outside of their own process. For houses of worships, you're still following the 
the same guidelines as a nonprofit organization. Um, I think, as Izette mentioned, let's say it is you know, commercial, the affordable housing, you know, it just, it depends on, that's where it gets a little nuanced for uh, houses of worship. Um, but again, reach out to me, let's talk about your project. But so long as you are a nonprofit organization that meets, you're gonna, charter schools also fall into that nonprofit uh, framework. So houses of worship also fall into that framework. And it came up again, so just to reiterate real quick, it is cjulian at brooklynbp.nyc.gov. And that's where you'll find me. Yep. Um, next question. Is capital budget strictly for brick and mortar, or are there any sort of operating costs that can be applied for? The... The short answer is no, no soft cost. Um, I think Azizet mentioned um, that there may be certain things depending on a project by project base, but overall, let's say no soft cost can be paid for with capital. Um, generally, it is brick and mortar, physical structures, items. Okay, and then I think I have a bunch of questions that are going to be directed to DCLA. Here I am. Hello, DCLA. Uh, question one is any DCLA funding from the city? I'm sorry. Any DCLA funding from city council in the past? Does it count towards qualifications for DCL funding from the borough president? Well, to apply, you do need uh, funding from DCLA specifically in the last essentially three, four fiscal years from FY18, 19, or 20, or 21. Um, so that's very specific. And that kind of discretionary funds that pass through uh, DCLA to you do, do not count. But you can email okay. that capital request at DCL at culture.nyc.gov if you have a very specific for your organization question. Great, thank you. Second question, did the DCLA requirements change from last year or is the funding for three consecutive years or is it only for one year of funding? Uh, you only need funding, uh, programmatic funding for one of those three, uh, four years. So yeah, we increased it actually a year because this year's uh, a little crazy. So it's FY 18, 19, 20 or 21 if you have funding in one of those years from programmatic funding specifically or institutional funding, um, you could potentially be eligible. Another question for DCLA. Can we enter a DCLA city agreement on a project that is through a state award, such as a construction of a space on a New York state renovation project? Darren, do you have a thought on that? <laughs> um, I. I think that's very specific and you should email us uh, for a large capital projects if you're asking if like funds from private funds can be matched into the project like those are possibilities like we're, we're the city can essentially one funding source and the state could have funds but those are very specific uh, so I would definitely suggest emailing us. And then this question isn't necessarily targeted at DCLA but my organization recently partnered with developers on a new building where we would have 8,000 square feet of property for our nonprofit. At what point can we apply for construction funds as the developers are now at the very beginnings of their plans? If you're a cultural institution, I would definitely email us if you have a question about this, if you've received programmatic funding the last three or four years. Um, because sometimes funds can get banked for a future project and things like that. Um, but I have no guarantee, I'm not guaranteeing anything here, but I would definitely talk to us. Okay. Um, kind of another all play question. 
for nonprofits that are located outside of Brooklyn, how can they apply for capital budget money? So if you're located outside of Brooklyn, you can apply for capital funding uh, to any of your borough presidents, any of the five borough presidents. Um, you know, also in cap grants, you can apply for funding uh, from the borough president and city council as well. Um, so, you know, and important to note also, each borough kind of manages their pre-vetting differently. Um, as I mentioned, Brooklyn Borough President has a uh, an online Google form. Um, I believe some boroughs require letters of intent. So reach out to that office, um, the elected officials within that borough, and just figure out, you know, what their, you know, pre-vetting is. But, you know, when once you go into cap grants, you know, it'll all be there, the different elected officials from all five boroughs that you can request from, funds from. And then Candace, another question that I think you can answer is when we talk about the money being reimbursable, mm -hmm. what exactly does that mean? When the money's, what, what does it mean when the money's are being reimbursable? So you're applying to the borough president for $50,000 to purchase a 15 passenger van. Um, you are going to be, you know, the organization is being reviewed and approved based on that project scope, all of the documents and review that's gonna go into it. Um, you will, you know, work with your managing agency. You know, it was mentioned that with like, let's say that vehicle there's titling. So you work all of that out. And upon the, you know, once that project, once that vehicle is purchased and paid for, then you start working through reimbursement um, where, you know, let's say you were awarded $50,000, you know, the final, the reimbursement cost was like $49,718. Um, you're reimbursed upon project completion. If that's two years or three years, um, your, pro your organization and the project is being approved and funded based on that project scope. You work with your managing agency. Once everything is completed, you're reimbursed. I don't know if any of the managing agencies have anything additional to add uh, on the reimbursement side, uh, but that's like my general, you know, concept of how re the reimbursement process works. It's once everything is completed. Yeah, and, and this is David, just, just echoing what Candace said. Um, in, in terms of the, um, from, from easy to difficult in doing these projects, Vehicles is definitely at the, um, the easy shot. They're, they're the quickest that we can do as compared to equipment or initial outfitting or equipment systems. In terms of reimbursable, before you even get to that point in time, you kind of have to go through this very elaborate process because as probably mentioned before, these are capital funds. And so once you're in the budget, it doesn't mean things are turned around you know, within two months or even a year. As I mentioned earlier, takes about two years and that two years includes our timetable for vehicles. So we have to actually get documents in place that are then going to be registered with the city controller's office, separately elected official. Once that's done, then the, we have what is called a registered contract. We actually have to have you, the organization, file a lien on behalf of the city of New York to, for that vehicle for the useful life. And the useful life can be anywhere from three to five years. Once that lien is filed and the city has really the right of first, I'm gonna say refusal, but that's not right the, the right term. If something happens and the organization cannot function or doesn't need that vehicle anymore, it reverts back to the city for that useful period. And the only way we can do that is by having this lien on the vehicle for the useful life. Once that is filed, then the requisition Flash invoice will be filed with our agency. The same project manager you've been working with will review it quickly and put it through the payment process, and then you'll be reimbursed. Usually, it's one hundred percent. People don't break out their payments for a vehicle, unlike maybe on construction or even on equipment systems. So it'll be one invoice, one requisition, and then there'll be one check. Um, I would just add there. So DDC typically, this isn't a hard and fast rule handles equipment projects, EDC manages um, construction projects, renovations, acquisitions. Um, and so the rules are different. And so make sure you're looking at your capital guidelines for that. Um, but in terms of reimbursement, I would just add a little nuance to what Candace is saying. 
um, it is reimbursement. So meaning the work needs to be completed, but also as David's saying, there are a number of steps to get that registered contract first. So you need a registered contract. You have to go through all of that to get there, which is a long process. And then you also need to complete the work and then seek reimbursement for it and then be reimbursed. Um, so it is a few steps away. Um, I'll just reiterate, HPD does not operate on a reimbursement basis. <laughs> Make sure that you have approval from HPD before you start any of your work. <laughs> Thank you all for that. And nonprofits, you can see why we had to ensure that our partners in government were here because again, it's very nuanced um, based on you know your project. And you know, after the the award is made, it's a whole different ball game. So for project preparedness, a term I heard from EDC and for capital, I thought it was magical. You know, these info sessions are a great space to just kind of wrap our heads around what happens next because it's a whole nother process. So thank you. Thank you for the additional insight. Mike, do we have any other questions? I have two more questions and then a housekeeping item. Okay. Uh, question one, is there a way to see my nonprofit's history when applying and receiving funds? Does anyone want to take that before I try to answer that question? <laughs> Sorry, it's not, it's not a DVD issue. Actually. Right, you know, really tricky. The one way, um, and I think David mentioned, you know, with nonprofit staff turnover sometimes is really, you know, tricky things, you know, information gets lost in translation. You know, I've seen where nonprofits went through through OMB's website, and forgive me for not knowing this exactly, but you can probably go through, I believe it was the Schedule C, you know, when the budget is adopted and, you know, it's put out there, you know, I've seen organizations go through 10 years of, you know, those budget documents to see if their organization had a history. Although, you know, three years is as far back, but just for their own institutional knowledge kind of, you know, went through all those, you know, years. So I think, you know, that may be a starting point um, going through OMB's, um, the budget documents, um, because you, know, you can reach out to my office to say, hey, did my organization receive an award from Borough President Adams? I would be able to look that up. But, um, oh, I'm sorry, you're talking about um, operating contracts. Yeah, that would definitely be the, the budget docs. But again, reach out to me. We can drill down a bit more as to how you can possibly find out if your organization received a uh, operating contracts from the city. All right, last question. What if a nonprofit wants to get a building for an after school program or an office for the foundation? Are they eligible for capital funding? I'm sorry, Mike, you said that was a nonprofit seeking to acquire property? Yes. Okay, um, so if that nonprofit meets the organization and the project scope, um, I would, you know, softly say yes. Property acquisitions are, could be a little tricky, so I would say reach out and, you know, have a conversation. Um, but on the surface, again, if you meet the eligibility requirements of prior, you know, history of operating contracts, three years of audited financials, full-time staff, and you know, the project scope, you know, is within the guidelines? Short answer, yes. <laughs> and then it gets, again, very nuanced. And then my final housekeeping item. Uh, so if anybody has, because there's a couple more nuanced questions that I'm not going to ask you. Okay. If somebody does have a very specific question, they should reach out to you. Yes, please reach out to me. Um, again, I'm the first line of defense in figuring out what's possible. And then I would reach out to my partners in government, EDC, DDC, DCLA to kind of get the, you know, the ball rolling on figuring things out and we'll go from there. So yes, definitely reach out to me um, to start talking about what you're thinking of applying for or pursuing. And I think there was a lot of information here and something that I saw pop up multiple times in the chat is when will this recording be available to view and where will it be viewable? 
So this recording will, let's say, a week from today. We've got to give my, our production team a couple, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how video editing works. Um, and it will be on the Borough President's YouTube channel. Um, I will, again, definitely make sure to share that in the email and the recap that I send out. Um, but look out at the Borough President's uh, social media platforms, the YouTube channel, Facebook, Mike, do you know where else we put videos? <laughs> That's, uh, I think you nailed it, that y'all okay. send it out when it's available and it'll be either on our YouTube or one of our social media outlets. Indeed. Excellent, no other questions? Again, there's a couple more in there that I think are very specific and I'm gonna recommend that they reach out to you. Excellent. Well, thank you all so very much. Um, David, Alyssa, Zizat, uh, Kevin, everyone, thank you all so very much for you know, providing the additional insight on what happens after a project receives funding from the borough president. Um, we are hosting a capital info sessions for city schools this Thursday, December 17th from 4 to 6 p.m. Feel free to email me uh, for more information. Um, I look forward to having follow-up conversations. Um, the capital budget intern, Dominic Combs, and I, uh, you know, we're here for you guys to walk you through this very nuanced process. Um, I would ask the managing agencies, do you guys have any final parting words for our nonprofits? They're going to definitely say reach out to me and then, you know, figure it out first. <laughs> but um, <laughs> also be sure to share uh, DCLA's um, info session. They mentioned that's going to be coming up in January. Um, EDC, if they do host any sort of virtual coffee hour, I will be sure to share that. Again, if you know me, you know I'm constantly sharing things via email. Um, be sure to sign up for the borough president's mailing list and check out our website for more information on virtual programming. Please stay safe, everyone. Stay warm and healthy as we make our way out through COVID and the pending snowstorm. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, Candace. All right, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Candace. Candace.